We're going to start things off this morning with those primary results coming in from several states, as well as that special election in Ohio. That race is too close to call, but the president is claiming victory this morning. David Wright is in Bedminster, New Jersey, where the president is on vacation. And David, what's the latest on all these races? Hi, Diana. Uh, that big race of the night was that special election in Columbus, Ohio, for a congressional seat. As you say, President Trump claiming victory there. Uh, Republican Troy Balderson does have a narrow lead, but it's narrow enough that we may not know for a couple of days or even weeks who might be ending up going uh, to fill that seat in Congress. The fact that that's that this uh, district is even close, though, uh, is a, a sign of alarm for the Republicans. This is a district that has only gone Democratic once since the 1940s. So uh, the fact that uh, if, if, the if the demographics uh, and the election results kind of uh, uh, hold true in other Trump strongholds, it could mean very bad news for the Republicans come November. And, uh, David, I know there were certain races that are sort of key you know, looked at anyway as big indicators for the fall. Uh, one was in Kansas. How, how did that play out? Well, in Kansas, you had uh, the incumbent governor, Jeff Collier, facing a challenge from Chris Kobach. Uh, President Trump endorsed Kobach, a hardline Republican, over the objections of some key Republican strategists. Uh, it, that race also too close to call. If Kobach wins, it would be a vindication for President Trump. But it could also uh, open the door for the Democrats in the fall. In this reddest of red states, the Democrats on their side nominated a woman, Laura Kelly, uh, for the governor's race. And she's one of a growing number of women, I think 11 in total, uh, who are getting the nods for gubernatorial positions in the fall. This could be the year of the woman. And it looks like the progressives took a bit of a blow in Michigan. Why is that so important? In Michigan and Missouri, uh, the Democratic Bernie Sanders wing of the party has been trying to mount a slate of candidates across the country, uh, and both of them uh, in Michigan and Missouri failed uh, against more conventional Democratic candidates. This is a setback for them, uh, but uh, it, it could be good news for the Democrats who hope uh, that their candidates will be able to win over moderates and Republicans. And, and then, David, are we hearing any more about the president's plans uh, with this potential interview with the special counsel? We are indeed. Uh, we're hearing from Rudy Giuliani that the president's team uh, will have an answer for Bob Mueller later today uh, in terms of their position on what the president's willing to agree to in terms of uh, an interview, whether it's written questions or a sit-down interview, what subjects they might agree to be covered. Uh, but this won't be the last word. Uh, Bob Mueller's team will no doubt uh, have some thoughts of their own on what's appropriate. And in the end, uh, Mueller's team also has the possibility of subpoenas. All right. We'll see what kind of a middle ground they come to. That's David Wright for us in Bedminster, New Jersey. Thanks, David. Uh, and now we're going to go over to that dramatic day in that trial of President Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort. It was another explosive day of testimony, only this time for the defense as Paul Manafort's ex-deputy was pummeled under cross-examination. Catherine Falders is in Alexandria, Virginia for us following the whole thing. Uh, Catherine, is quite a contrast from Monday to Tuesday, so what are we expecting today? Yeah, Diane, so we just got word from our reporter, Trish Turner, who's been sitting in that courtroom for hours every day that Rick Gates has wrapped. He's off the witness stand. Now, this comes after three days of explosive testimony. The defense cross-examined him uh, for about an, a little under an hour uh, this morning, and he's been questioned by prosecutors for about uh, five hours total um, over the course of, of his time here. And he's detailed Manafort's alleged schemes to hide millions of dollars to avoid taxes and detailed how exactly he uh, committed bank fraud, how Manafort committed bank fraud. Now, Gates also went into his time on President Trump's 2016 uh, campaign, detailing his work there and also his work on the transition team for President Trump. Gates testified that Manafort sought favors af from him after Trump uh, was elected president. The example the prosecution uh, gave uh, yesterday in the court was an email that Manafort sent to Gates trying to secure an administration job for someone named Steve Kalk. Now, Kalk is the former CEO of a bank where Manafort allegedly secured uh, fraudulent loans in the defense. Uh, they have painted uh, Gates as a liar and embezzler, um, and they think, frankly, he's a flawed witness, Diane. So now that Gates is done testifying, what's next for this case? 
So Gate, now that Gates is done, the prosecution um, could call other witnesses. I just got word uh, that they're calling a FBI a forensic accountant. That's word um, from just inside the court. So that's uh, really all we know now in terms of who they will call. In terms of when this will wrap up, uh, we expected it to move quickly. It is moving rather quickly, and the prosecution is expected uh, to rest their case by the end of the week. All right, so it seems like they're heading towards some sort of a conclusion here. Are you getting any sense from either side on how they think the case is going? Yes. Yeah, so Manafort's attorneys, his lead attorney, uh, Kevin Downing, was walking out of the hotel across the street, and I asked him how he was feeling this morning. He says they're feeling good. Look, they view Gates as a flawed witness. They view him as somebody who embezzled, who lied, who they say had a separate secret life with, with a mistress in London, something Gates admitted to. They say he funded uh, that life years ago through money uh, that he stole from Manafort, Diane. But they also say, look, he's somebody who has pled guilty to conspiracy, to lie to federal investigators and now he's cooperating for a more lenient sentence a line of questioning in that courtroom yesterday Diane the defense said after all the lie after all the lies you've told do you expect this jury to believe you he said I do one of the attorneys said last week well Rick Gates is willing to say anything to save himself all right well we'll find out soon enough if the jury does believe him Catherine Falders for us in Alexandria Virginia thanks Catherine and now we're going to go over to California, where at least 18 wildfires are still burning there. Thousands more uh, homes there are under evacuation. And now schools, some schools in the area are being forced to postpone that first day of school. Will Carr is in Trabuco Canyon for us following it all. Will, it's just devastating looking at these images. Good morning, Diane. There are more than 14,000 firefighters on the front lines across California right now. And with so many fires raging, resources are really stretched thin. There are 17 large uncontained wildfires across the Golden State this morning. They've scorched more than 600,000 acres and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and structures. The Mendocino Complex fire, now nearly the size of Los Angeles, 450 square miles. It's burning for its 12th day. The fire scorching terrain turning land into a hellscape. It is now the largest fire ever in California's history. The Holy Fire here in Southern California is burning for its third day. It's 5% contained and threatening communities nearby. We've seen a handful of homes that have burned. Take a look at some of that damage. This house really didn't stand a chance. As you're walking along, you can see the stones on the wall of this house charred. And then you can see, check this out. This is pieces of the roof now just rubble. We've seen this charred beam that's now resting on the skeleton of a tractor and then of course you have this gas line that is still burning. As you walk over here you can see this home gutted that uh, fireplace in the distance everything else really hard to make out. I see and then look at video of this fire NATO churning through the mountainside overnight and these fires have turned fatal at least nine people killed in California this year and it seems like we say this week after week but this is still a young fire season and last year one of the worst fires didn't break out until December. Diane. Yeah, well, hard to believe we're just at the beginning of that fire season. And unfortunately, those fires are not getting any help from the weather. Some parts of the country will be seeing triple digits on the thermostat today. Ginger Z is here now with our full forecast. Ginger. Diane, thank you. Let's start with the fire whirl from the Holy Fire. That's in Southern California. This happens when you've got intense heat from the fire lifting up very quickly and other cooler, relatively cooler air fills in behind. You get rotation. Just one of the dangers of these wildfires, so many of them, and yes, the largest in the recent history, burning in that Mendocino complex fire. That's an area where you'll see red flag warnings today, not just because relative humidities are as low as 5%, but because wind gusts are going to go up to 35 miles per hour. The heat is extreme, and we've got extreme heat from Portland to Salem up to Seattle, who will see likely their ninth 90 plus degree today. That is more than three times their annual average, and we're going to stick with it. Tomorrow they could do another one. That's only happened twice, two other times in their history in Seattle, and they don't have air conditioning, a lot of them. So looking at the East Coast, we do have one more day of this muggy, hot, hot weather before the cold front comes through. From South Carolina up through Massachusetts, we have heat advisories. It's really the level of moisture in the air that's going to make this dangerous, especially if you're exposed for prolonged periods of time outside. Then that'll come through and eventually storms, which we'll talk about in a moment. But these storms, several of them across the Pacific, moving west. And look at Hurricane Hector. That's the one so many folks have been tweeting me and asking on Facebook, we're going to Hawaii. Is this a big deal? Well, if you're going to the Big Island today or tonight, yes, it's a big deal because you'll see high, high surf up to 18 feet. Some rain showers that could bring anywhere from 
you know, a couple of inches of rain falling very quickly with some of those outer bands. So something we're going to be watching now. We talked about storms. This happened Tuesday night. Three people actually struck by lightning in Queens. Those images are really stunning to see when people capture that. But just a reminder that any time you have a thunderstorm, it doesn't have to be severe for there to be lightning, and lightning kills. So just keep that in mind as the cold front approaches anywhere from Nashville, really, through Boston today, we have the possibility of those showers and thunderstorms. Diane? All right, Ginger, thanks. So we got to be on the lookout for fires, be on the lookout for lightning, be on the lookout for rough surf. And now we also have to be on the lookout for sharks. Shark week is over, but apparently the East Coast did not get the memo. A young girl in North Carolina is recovering from an attack this morning, and a researcher on Cape Cod had a fairly scary and close encounter with a great white as well. Victor Kendo is in Miami monitoring all the encounters for us. And Victor, it feels like we're hearing about this more and more often. Is this happening more frequently? Well, Diane, there definitely has been an uptick in shark attacks over the last 10 years. And we should mention that the summer is the busiest season for shark attacks. And just take a look at the reason why. It's 11 a.m. and Miami Beach is already packed this morning. So with more people coming out into the beach, the more likely that you'll encounter a shark. Now, there is another factor at play here. In speaking with a scientist uh, from Florida Atlantic University, he explained that with the Earth's rising temperatures, the ocean temperatures are rising as well. And with that, sharks are migrating further north. So we're now seeing attacks in places where we seldom saw them before. Uh, the most recent shark attacks, you mentioned that girl in North Carolina. She was standing out in shallow water when a shark uh, bit her in the leg. Thankfully, her father was able to get to her quickly and carry her out of the water. Uh, she was bleeding, but she will be okay. And those few incidents, those close calls in Massachusetts, you had a beach in Cape Cod. Surfers cleared right out when a shark swam right through a group while going after a seal. And then that researcher, he was actually trying to tag one of those sharks and it came right out of the water uh, with its mouth open, is what he said. Uh, some very close calls right there. Uh, one more thing to watch out for. Uh, for everyone in the north where the water is definitely murkier than what we have here in Florida, it's harder to spot those sharks and that could create some potentially dangerous situations. Diane? So, Victor, is there any sign of this calming down at all? I wish I could say yes, but the reality of it right now is that as the uh, Earth's temperatures continue to rise, these sharks are going to keep migrating north, finding higher and higher latitudes. So uh, that's kind of the case. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, summer is the busiest season for this because that's when everyone hits the beaches. So perhaps, you know, those numbers will scale back down uh, once fall and winter rolls around. But that's really the, the only scenario right now. All right. Maybe we'll enjoy some sunbathing or hitting up the pool instead. <laughs> Victor Kendo in Miami for us. Stay safe, Victor. Thank you. And now to that manhunt underway in New Jersey after two officers were ambushed just sitting in their cars. Police are now searching for that suspect and Lindsay Davis is in Camden, New Jersey, keeping an eye on all of this for us. Lindy, I know it's very early in the investigation, but what do we know so far? Diane, good afternoon to you. You know, there is active uh, manhunt going on for the shooter, as you can imagine. Uh, police have just set up a tip line. They're asking for people who may have heard anything, seen anything last night to please the, give them a call. You can see there's a bit of a, a media presence set up right here on this corner, and it's just in the same direction, about a half mile away, that the shooting actually took place around 8.30 last night. Police say that a man approached the car. It was an unmarked car with the two officers sitting just waiting at at a red light when the man opened fire. Police are saying that he got off as many as 25 rounds and then fled the scene. Now, fortunately, the police officers sustained non-life-threatening injuries. The male detective was shot twice in the arm. The female detective was shot once in the hand, and they were taken here uh, to Cooper Hospital. You can, there's been a bit of a police presence in and out. You can see that police car still uh, outside right there. Now, uh, this actually happened on National Night Out ironically, which is a night that's intended to bring uh, the community together with the police, Diane. Such a sad irony there, Lindsay. And is there any inclination of a motive? Do police think that it was purposely done on this day? So it's still unclear. What we do know is that these shootings that target police, it's at a four year rise. Many say that it's in response to communities being frustrated after this recent string of black men and teens being shot and killed by police. But at the same time, uh, these officers were undercover. They were in an unmarked car. So it's not clear exactly uh, if they were being targeted uh, and shot because they were police officers. All right, interesting, Lindsay. All right, well, the important thing, of course, is that it sounds like they're going to be okay.
which is huge in all of this, but of course lots yes. of people hoping that they find that suspect quickly. Lindsay Davis for us in Camden, New Jersey. Thanks, Lindsay. And finally, we're going to end things off on a much lighter note. Over in Alabama with a groom who took the plunge to say I do and moments later took a very different plunge to save a swimmer in trouble. Here's his story. Cindy and Zach Edwards' wedding day turned into a heroic adventure when during a beachside photo shoot, the Coast Guardman was called into action. A lady had come up to us and they told us, you know, that guy's out there, he's struggling a little bit and he can't get back. He's having a hard time. 18-year-old Jamel Robinson was stranded out in the water with nothing but his boogie board. And I'm like, you don't have time. The guy kept drifting further and further out. She said, don't worry about your pants, just go. So you got to listen to your wife, you know, because otherwise you're in trouble. So Zach ditched his formal wear and dove in with his bride waiting in the surf, gown and all. It beat us up pretty hard getting in, so I got up and she's running out in her wedding dress. I'm bleeding from the nose and trying to tell her to get away because I know how important that dress was. I didn't want it wet. But it was all worth it as Zach got Jamel safely to shore. You know, the grandkids are going to have a story, <laughs> you know. Um, it was a perfect day, beautiful wedding. Hero and hubby in the same day. And this morning, Jamel and his mom have a special message for Zach. Thank you for helping me and saving my life. And I really appreciate that. I just want to thank Mr. Zach for just taking the initiative to go out there. I really, really appreciate him. Worth pointing out that there were wet red flag warnings on the beach that day. So just another reminder of how important it is to heed those warnings. But Jamel this morning is doing just fine. He even made it to his first day of school as a high school senior. And that does it for us on ABC News Live. But you